Well, uh, thank you, Georgina, and uh, to all of you at the uh, Robert Menzies Institute behind this excellent conference. So with the theme of Menzies, the early years, uh, this paper will focus on how the young Robert adopted his Presbyterian faith and how this nourished his philosophy of liberalism and shaped his anti-sectarian views. Now Menzies in his latter life, of course, had much to say about both liberalism and anti-sectarianism uh, from the formation of the Liberal Party in 1944 to the delivery of state aid in 1964. But the scope of this paper will be on the formation of these ideas in Menzies boyhood, youth and early public life. So beginning with his religious faith, uh, Menzies was an old style broad church Presbyterian who cherished the Scottish heritage of his church. Fond of describing himself as a simple Presbyterian, Menzies had inherited a strong tradition of Scots Presbyterianism from his father's side. According to Menzies biographer, Alan Martin, James Menzies seemed to blend the strict Calvinism of Presbyterianism uh, with a more emotional temperament fostered by Methodist teachings. So it was into this religious background that Robert Menzies was born with regular church going and Bible reading forming a major part of his early upbringing. In the household of the young Menzies, the main books included the Bible, uh, the Presbyterian hymn book, uh, the Ingoldsby legends and the Pilgrim's progress. Now, Menzies' Christianity was very broad and non-sectarian, but in public he made little secret of his pride in identifying as Presbyterian. Of his Presbyterian church, he once remarked, how proud we ought to be of the history of our church, how proud we ought to be to consider its roots in Scotland, its flourishing and growth in Australia, its vast missionary enterprises, the clarity of its thinking, the concentration upon the essence. As a proud Scottish Australian, Menzies saw his Presbyterian as, as integral uh, to his ethnic identity in much the same way that many Irish and German Australians respectively viewed their Catholicism and their Lutheranism. Dating back to the 16th century Scottish Calvinist uh, John Knox, uh, Presbyterianism, of course, had been deeply woven into the Scottish cultural fabric uh, with the State Church of Scotland. So Presbyterianism, of course, arrived in Australia through British colonisation, and together with Anglicanism, Roman Catholicism and Methodism, it was one of the four great faith traditions of early modern Australia. So as such, it contributed richly to the cultural and civic life of the nation, through its churches, charities, educational institutions, and influential networks of professionals and public figures. Bringing a reformed variety of Protestantism to Australia, Presbyterianism did much to contribute to the evolving national psyche. The Melbourne Argus um, credited Presbyterianism for impressing the ideals of liberty, uh, citizenship, personal responsibility, public duty and service to the community. In his latter years as Prime Minister, Menzies affirmed these principles as the great drivers of democracy and national progress. As well as embodying the social values of Presbyterianism, Menzies assented to much of its theology contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And so these included, of course, the core Christian beliefs in the sovereignty of God, uh, the authority of the Bible, and Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. But unlike many of his fellow churchmen, Menzies was not really a strict Calvinist who adhered strictly to every letter of these doctrinal standards. Uh, his own form of Presbyterianism was simple practical and doctrinally minimalist. For his part, he was happy to go straight back to the Bible to draw his Christian beliefs and leave the finer points of doctrine for the theologians. 
As a Presbyterian layperson in public life, he saw his chief vocation as not so much to expound on doctrine as to give practical effect to broad Christian principles. In addition to Presbyterianism, Menzies was shaped profoundly by Methodism uh, through both his father's lay leadership in the Japarat Methodist Church and also his education at Melbourne's Wesley College. Revering the Methodist founder, John Wesley, as one of the great immortals of the 18th century, he credited Wesley for breathing life into the English church. And forging a close relationship with a Melbourne Methodist leader, Sir Clarence Irving Benson, Menzies imbibed Methodist beliefs in personal free will, practical works of service, and this optimism in human progress under God. Like the 20th century Australian liberal philosopher, Frederick Eggleston, Menzies blended these Methodist impulses with liberal ideals. Both Eggleston and Menzies affirmed that sacrificing oneself for the common good was essential to the survival of democracy and liberalism. Accordingly, Menzies espoused a liberalism infused with Christian ideals, at least in its understanding of the divine origins of human dignity and freedom. It was not philosophically dissimilar to either the British Whig liberalism of Edmund Burke and Gladstone, uh, the US Republican tradition of Lincoln, or more contemporaneously, the Christian democracy of 20th century Europe. In common with these overseas traditions, the liberalism of Menzies affirmed the values of individual freedom and dignity, private property rights, free enterprise, class harmony, cooperation between employer and employee, as well as the freedoms of speech, religion and association. As both Larry Sidentop and Tom Holland acknowledge, Christianity played a foundational role in shaping the liberal precepts of human dignity and equality, which helped to deliver and define modern societies in the West. Like democratic traditions in both Europe and the United States, Menzies' own philosophy of liberalism was based on a conception of democracy that viewed all individuals as possessing equal dignity in the sight of God. Speaking in October 1942 on the nature of democracy, Menzies pronounced that democracy is more than a machine. It is a spirit. It is based upon the Christian conception that there is in every human soul a spark of the divine, that with all their inequalities of mind and body, the souls of men stand equal in the sight of God. For Menzies, this foundation to liberal democracy was basic and broad enough to appeal to Protestants, uh, to Catholics, Jews and other Australians of faith, uh, particularly when counterposed with a common enemy of godless communism. So the Christian ideals of the Australian liberalism that Menzies would revive in the 1940s uh, were evident in his applause for humane social reforms, the affirmation of a selfless individualism, the pursuit of a good neighbour foreign policy, a commitment to a civilised capitalism and appeal to the natural law. Now, much of this character to the liberalism of Menzies uh, could be traced back to the Federation liberalism of Alfred Deacon, as uh, Judith just alluded to previously. So Deacon himself uh, held to a non-utilitarian form of liberalism that affirmed the primacy of the common good, the moral duties of the individual citizen to society, and the place for ameliorative social reform. In this vein, Deacon had supported factory legislation in colonial Victoria and minimum wages to ensure that all should have what was their due. Now, such social reform measures had deep Christian roots, uh, both in the evangelical social activism of figures such as William Wilberforce and Lord Shaftesbury, 
and also in uh, Catholic social teaching. Now Menzies likewise had identified with these social reform impulses of liberalism, uh, welcoming the abolition of slavery and child labour, uh, together with industrial relations reform, as some of the great achievements of liberal democracy. Now with uh, individualism characteristically representing uh, one of the defining traits of liberalism, uh, Menzies' own particular emphasis on a selfless individualism uh, gave his liberal creed a decidedly Christian inflection. Now by selfless individualism, Menzies meant that whilst the state fulfilled an important ameliorative role, it fell primarily to the compassionate spirit and self-sacrifice of individuals to help the needy and to further the common good. For Menzies, the ethic of selfless individualism could be summed up in the biblical concept of being my brother's keeper, whereby individuals took responsibility for the welfare of their neighbours. Hailing this as the noblest embodiment of Christian philosophy, uh, this ethic was so foundational to Menzies that he once observed that the oldest expression of democracy was inherent in the question from Genesis, am I my brother's keeper? Now holding to a common ecumenical Christianity uh, that transcended sectarian divisions, Menzies sought to heal the Catholic Protestant divide that had long blighted Australian society. Born into a de decade where deep divisions festered between predominantly working class Irish Catholics and uh, middle class Protestants, uh, Menzies was all too familiar with the sectarian rancour that simmered in the community. And in the shadow of the Great War, uh, Menzies witnessed the acrimonious conflict over conscription between Prime Minister Billy Hughes and Daniel Mannix, the Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne. Years later, Menzies reflected on this reality of his early life. And he said, my youth was lived in a period of Australian social history where there was much religious intolerance. Sectarianism was not engaged in solely by one side but from my earliest days, it nauseated me. Raised as a Protestant, Menzies nonetheless felt an instinctive revulsion of sectarianism from an early age. First, he saw the spectacle of different Christians at bitter loggerheads as really at odds with the message of Christ for fellow believers to love one another. He went so far to deplore sectarianism strife as a denial of Christianity and not its proof. To be sure, Menzies did recognise the tremendous diversity of the universal Christian church across all branches and recognised that there could always be differences amongst Christians over theology, uh, church government, worship, liturgy and the sacraments. He regarded sectarianism, however, as having much less to do with conscientious differences and disagreements between Protestants and Catholics uh, than with a mutually hostile cultural tribalism that he regarded as unchristian, illiberal and corrosive to the social fabric. Menzies' distaste of sectarianism also sprang from his exposure to a broad common Christianity in his early life. Uh, first from the new community of Japarat, where denominational barriers between the Protestant churches were fluid, um, with his Presbyterian of father, father having no qualms about um, belonging to a Methodist church. And second from his student years with the pan-Protestant uh, Student Christian Union here at Melbourne University. Now through the uh, SCU, uh, the primary focus was with the basics of Christianity on which all denominations could agree, uh, such as the nature and person of Jesus Christ, and not so much on doctrinal specifics. 
So this more ecumenical outlook at the Melbourne University SEU uh, contrasted with the sectarian anti-Catholicism of his family background. Appearing on the same platform as Archbishop Daniel Mannix uh, to open a Catholic school in his electorate uh, shortly after his election to Victorian Parliament in 1928, uh, Menzies was excoriated by his family. As his political career progressed in the 1930s, uh, he continued to confront religious intolerance. Uh, when as Attorney General of Victoria, he resisted some attempts by Protestants to ban a uh, Catholic Eucharistic procession through Melbourne. And as Prime Minister in 1939, he addressed a peace rally here in Melbourne and stressed the shared faith of all present by drawing attention to himself as a Presbyterian on a Catholic platform. As well as his broad Christianity, Menzies also saw sectarian attitudes as out of place in a liberal pluralist democracy such as Australia. As the elected representatives of the people, he believed that it behoved him to represent people of all faiths or indeed none with no sectarian prejudice impairing that objective. This was yet another point where his broad religious outlook intersected with his liberal principles. His acceptance of and ease with a diversity of Christian traditions accorded with his liberal instinct for religious toleration in civil society and each was anathema to the sectarianism of his youth. As David Kemp noted, Menzies resolved to turn his back on old sectarian divisions together with those of race and class was part of his liberal mission to forge a new political culture based on mutual respect and understanding between citizens of all backgrounds. Now Menzies fusion of Christian and liberal principles which fostered this toleration of diversity within the communion of Christians uh, had historical roots in the early liberalism of colonial Australia. Menzies himself stood very much in the tradition of Edmund of Richard Burke, uh, the reformist Whig governor of New South Wales, who during his time as governor put all religious denominations in colonial New South Wales on an equal footing uh, through the Church Act of 1836. So like Richard Burke, who was a loyal Anglican, uh, Menzies was faithful to his own church, yet he favoured an inclusive and common Christianity as the basis for a free and moral society. So this simple Presbyterian, who would become Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, stood essentially in a long liberal tradition of religious toleration, dating right back to John Locke and the first generation of English Whigs. Mediated through the Enlightenment, it was inspired by a Christianity that affirmed the inherent dignity, freedom and equality of all people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, that was that was fascinating. And we had you on the Afternoon Light podcast the other day about this very topic. Uh, and it really is um, something that I think people don't really understand about Menzies um, worldview was how much his Presbyterian roots form part of that. Um, and that, and that story you tell about Menzies speaking at the Catholic event and uh, his family family strongly criticising him um, shows that Menzies' anti-sectarianism did not come from his upbringing, though, did it? Um, I, I wonder um, how did Menzies avoid developing that sectarian perspective despite his upbringing when so many of his nearest and dearest held those views? Yes, well, certainly, I think um, probably um, I think the main thing was um, possibly his education at Wesley College. Um, he would have crossed paths with a lot of um, 
his fellow peers from different uh, religious backgrounds, different Protestant denominations, and probably sizable numbers of Jews and others of different faiths. And um, I think especially when he was part of the uh, Melbourne University Student Christian Union, I think that really um, probably instilled him with a more kind of ecumenical minded um, approach to Christianity and uh, sort of those old sort of um, Protestant um, sectarian sentiments um, kind of faded a bit into the background, um, even though he continued to proudly identify as uh, Presbyterian. Um, I think that was the case. And uh, as he matured into a young man and um, became involved with the um, Melbourne Bar as a young barrister, again, he would have been in sort of diverse uh, religious circles, um, again, coming into contact with many Jews and Catholics and others of different faiths. Um, all right, Jeremy Mann from the Australian Monarchist League and also a student here at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'd be interested to hear uh, what your thoughts are on the idea that, um, I guess, Menzies' pursuit of anti-sectarianism had some form of um, support from those uh, disenfranchised working class Catholics from the Labor Party, and also in terms of the formation of a broad church um, party that was opposed to, as you put it, uh, godless communism as well. Yes, thank you, Jeremy, um, for your question. Um, yes, I think uh, definitely um, there were uh, sizable numbers of Catholics that um, gravitated to uh, Menzies' Liberal Party even before the DLP came onto the scene because I think in the 1949 election um, that sort of received the highest vote of Catholics for a non-Labour Party to date. And so I think a lot of... Uh, Catholics were attracted to uh, Menzies' appeal to um, sort of ordinary forgotten people and also his strong anti-communism as well, which of course was um, taught by the Catholic Church and shared also by the uh, Protestant denominations. And so um, they were attracted to uh, the Liberal Party. And uh, so the Liberal Party has... Um, always been a sort of a broad church. Um, that's not to say that in some Liberal Party branches there were incidences of anti-Catholic prejudice, but uh, the prevailing culture uh, the, the, from Menzies, who led the party, was that um, it would be open to all people of all faiths or none. David, David, I want to congratulate you on your book and your presentation. It's one of the more interesting contributions about Menzies I think we've had in recent years. Uh, my question goes to someone you mentioned in the middle of your presentation, um, Irving Benson. Um, and I know Menzies used to give these uh, presentations to the so-called pleasant Sunday afternoon sessions, uh, which were often broadcast on radio. Um, and I'd like you to reflect on that because... Um, I'm wondering your, your view about how you, you know how Menzies wasn't particularly doctrinaire or strict in his sort of faith. He had a very practical outlook. And the fact that he was so willing to give these public lectures, in a sense, expressing a kind of social gospel, um, is very interesting uh, to me. And we don't really see politicians today talk about their faith or talk about uh, lessons and instructions uh, from their faith that can be applied in a public realm. Um, so could you reflect on how Menzies did that and, and whether there is a contrast with today? Yes, well, thank you very much, Troy, uh, for your kind remarks. And uh, yes, I think to a large degree, uh, Menzies was a product of his time. Um, I mentioned in my book that um, the key to understanding uh, Menzies' um, engagement with the uh, Christian churches was that uh, the Christian churches of all kinds uh, had a much more visible place um, in the society um, of the 1950s and 60s than they do in our much more secular age today. Uh, the major newspapers, for example, used to print uh, the sermons of leading church figures and um, 
Christianity was discussed much more in public and uh, it was uh, also accepted more universally as the uh, spiritual and moral foundation of um, civil society. And so within that um, context, um, Menzies was able to um, publicly expound um, Christian values um, in a social context that was very congenial. And he was able to uh, have close relationships with clerics such as uh, Clarence Irving Benson, uh, who became a close personal friend of his. And uh, as you mentioned in your question, he would routinely uh, be a guest at uh, Irving Benson's pleasant Sunday afternoons. Um, as would other political figures, including uh, R.G. Casey, who um, was Menzies' um, external affairs minister, and Harold Holt as well, and uh, from the opposition, Arthur Cornwall, the Labour Party would sometimes address these uh, pleasant Sunday afternoons. And it was, uh, I guess, Irving Benson's own civic ministry, if you like, of engaging his church uh, with the public sphere. And um, Menzies responded in kind by um, making himself available to uh, address these uh, meetings of Benson uh, to often talk about um, politics and um, sort of the spiritual and moral bases of uh, politics and um, the addresses that Menzies gave to these um, pleasant Sunday afternoons were not richly theological or doctrinally uh, specific, but um, he would appeal to basic sort of um, spiritual and moral values. Ah, so I take it when the Armenian and the Calvinist wrestled each other in Menzies' soul, the Armenian won from, what, from the way you described it. And yet he continued to identify as, as Presbyterian, even though theologically he doesn't seem to have been that far. And the other thing, just a couple of points related to that. One is that Presbyterians are primarily responsible for a lot of the sectarians in Australia, perhaps more the Irish Presbyterians, Northern Irish, rather than perhaps the Scottish, or they're both. Um, and I wonder if the thing that's missing here is Menzies' love of England, because of what you're actually describing as his religious position sounds to me a lot like liberal Anglicanism. And that's been very important in Australia um, since the 19th century. That was the position that really dictated a lot of the education, secular education, was a sort of liberal Anglican position, which I think Richard Burke was probably a liberal Anglican, some sort perhaps. Uh, but he was Irish, of course. And, said to be distantly related to Edmund. So I'm wondering whether in fact, and when you talk about religion, whether there's also the English factor because Menzies was a great Anglophile. He's like David Hume. He's a Scotsman who loves England. And I, I'm just wondering whether, you know, because it's all a bit of a puzzle to me, how the Methodism, the Presbyterianism and the English bit fit together. Yes, well, thank you, Greg. That's. Um very sort of uh, good sort of questions to mull over and um, you know uh, Menzies was um, there was a complexity to be sure to his uh, religious formation um, as you rightly say I think the uh, Arminian <coughs> spirit sort of prevailed over the more Calvinist um, disposition of classical Presbyterianism and I think there's a reason for that I think that's because um, he found the uh, Wesleyan Arminian influence, he found the Wesleyan Arminian emphasis on human free will more congenial perhaps to his own liberal philosophy that likewise stressed the freedom of the individual and uh, free will. But that said, he uh, remained uh, attached to uh, his Presbyterian roots. And, um, you know, he was sort of a middle of a road Presbyterianism, Presbyterian. On the one hand, he wasn't a, uh, a strict orthodox um, 
Presbyterian who adhered to the Westminster Confession of Faith. But on the other hand, he wasn't a radical, liberal, sort of uniting church style Presbyterian either. So he was sort of a um, old school, um, broad church Presbyterian who affirmed the essentials of Christianity, but also the uh, practical emphasis on good works and um, public service. Thank you very much, David. And that brings to an end uh, the second session of the conference on Menzies Thought.